All right, this is what the control panel you all should be seeing, just a few more housekeeping items. Um, all the audio functions should be muted. There is an option to change your screen size, so you can hit that button to view a full view of the presentation or to minimize it. And at the bottom, you should see that questions panel. So please leave any comments or questions as they come to your mind. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Center for Sustainable Energy, I wanted to give a quick overview. Since 1996, we have been partnering with local, state, and regional governments to advance clean energy. A core part of our mission is to provide information and best practices like this webinar to help reduce barriers to, the, to clean energy adoption. CSE is unique in that we provide technical assistance and energy program implementation as well as industry engagement and policy feedback as part of our core services. Our work has been primarily focused in California, but we are recently expanding our assistance throughout the U.S. We now have offices in Boston, Berkeley, and L.A. So CSE manages several projects on behalf of the San Diego Regional Energy Partnership to advance the market for energy efficient buildings. This webinar is part of a larger zero net energy project sponsored by SD Rep. As you can see here, SD Rep is made up of the City of San Diego, the County of San Diego, City of Chula Vista, the San Diego Association of Governments, also known as SANDAG, the Port of San Diego, and as well as SDG&E. Last year, as part of this webinar series, we presented our Zero Net Energy Roadmap for local governments. And this year, we are continuing the webinar series, diving deeper into how different technologies and policies can support ZE efforts. In past webinars, we discussed the role of EV charging and solar water heating in reaching ZE. You can find a copy of this roadmap report at energycenter.org slash ZNE. We'll be hosting three more webinars this year, so please log on to energycenter.org slash events to sign up for those upcoming webinars. We will have another one June 28th next week. On our ZNE webpage, you can also find copies of our past webinars in addition to this report. So to kick it off, what is zero net energy? The California Energy Commission defines a zero net energy code building as one, as one where the net amount of energy produced by on-site renewable energy resources is equal to the value of the energy consumed annually by that building. This is at the level of a single project seeking development entitlements and building code permits, and it's measured using the California Energy Commission's time-dependent valuation metric, also called the TDV. So a few notes regarding the Energy Commission's definition. The Energy Commission is exploring the possibility of allowing community renewable energy to substitute for on-site renewable energy for buildings that cannot accommodate on-site renewables. Another note is that the Energy Commission is, trying, is tying their definition to the value of consumed energy based on the TDV metric. This means that the amount of renewable energy necessary to offset energy consumption will depend on the time of day, the season, and the climate zone in which that energy is used. Also, a building does not need to be all electric to meet this definition. Natural gas and propane are accounted for in the TDV calculation. For the Ener Energy Commission ZNE definition, it's not about operations. It's about how the building is modeled based on a design and construction. Plug load and occupant behavior could make a ZNE building ZNE code building very different from an actual ZNE building. To determine whether a building is a ZNE code building, building departments will have to rely on energy modeling documents submitted along with a new construction permit application to verify and enforce these ZNE standards. It's also important to note that the Energy Commission definition is different than other ZNE definitions, including the Department of Energy. As you can see here, the DOE definition is concerned with comparing actual energy used versus produced on site. 
Here in California, we are starting to see the ZNE definition evolve as entities are thinking more about how to achieve ZNE not only in new construction, but in existing buildings that may not trigger code when retrofitted. We advise you to stay tuned with the CPUC and the CEC to monitor the ZNE definition for both residential and commercial facilities over the next few years. So we're going to kick off some polling questions just to get a lay of the land about who we have on today's webinar. Um, so if you can use your polling function that should show up on your control panel, we've got our first question. So what category best re represents you? Who do we have on the line today? And we'll give maybe 20 or 30 seconds to have some answers tallied. Great, so it looks like about 22% of the folks on the line are from city or, city or county staff or elected officials, so that's really great to hear. 33% um, is coming in at other. We've got about a quarter of the folks from the architect and develop, developer and contractor industries. Um, so that's really great. Looks like we've got some, some good variation in the audience. Next, we're gonna move on to one more polling question. All right, so just to get a lay of the land about how familiar everyone is on the line with California's ZNE goals, go ahead and use that polling function once more. Great, right, so it looks like about half the audience is somewhat familiar, which was to be expected. We have about 10% that are very familiar and another 37% that are not familiar. So I'm glad to hear that variation and hopefully today's webinar can provide some enlightenment. All right, great. So California z &E goals. All new residential construction will be z &E by 2020 all new and 50% of existing state-owned public buildings will be ZNE by 2025. Sorry, that should just read 50% of existing state-owned buildings. <laughs> and 50% of existing commercial buildings will be ZNE by 2030. Given these dates are not too distant in the future, it is imperative that building professionals, customers, and local jurisdictions understand what their roles are in reaching these goals. So how does California achieve these ZNE goals? At the state level, the primary regulatory mechanism for achieving these ZNE goals are the state building codes, Title 24, Part 6, and appliance standards, Title 20. These codes are revamped every three years or so, meaning we will see two more iterations of Title 24 be before it, re it requires ZNE for new homes. And actually, that will be one more iteration in 2019. However, local jurisdictions can implement policies and programs to get in front of these state mandates. That's where our roadmap and the information in today's webinar can come into play. All right, the third of four polling questions. Um, does your community or company have any goals specifically related to ZE building? Right, so it spreads evenly across the board. Um, about a quarter said yes, a quarter said no. Uh, another quarter is considering ZNE goals, and another 20% is not applicable. Great. And for those of you who do have these ZNE goals, does your community or company conduct any education or outreach to help stakeholders comply with the energy code and or go beyond this code? Great, the numbers are coming in pretty high for yes, so we really like to see that you know additional education and outreach is, is being implemented out there. 
Um, about 20% said no, and 30% about not applicable. So hopefully this webinar can spur some inspiration about just an example of how you might conduct education and outreach to help your stakeholders comply. Great, thanks so much. All right, so for today's panel, we are gonna hear from a great roster of, of speakers. To kick it off, we have Andy Woodall, she is our project manager here at CSE, managing the Self-Generation Incentive Program, which I'm sure many of you are aware of and interested in. Following that, we're going to hear from Mike Hopkins and Claude McGee. They both worked on the Palm Springs Cultural Center Solar Plus Energy Storage Project, so we'll hear a recap of that case study. And to wrap it up, we will hear from Steve Kelly and Chad Coster about the Green Charge Network projects throughout the Poway Unified School District. So these should be really interesting case studies that we'll hear from, and we will wrap it up with a Q&A session for any of the panelists here. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and kick it off to Andy. Great. Thanks for the warm welcome, Ali. I appreciate it. Um, as Ali mentioned, my name is Andy Woodall. I'm the project manager with the Self-Generation Incentive Program here at the Center for Sustainable Energy, and we administer the program on behalf of San Diego Gas and Electric. Today I'm going to be providing you with an overview of energy storage, which will include different types of storage and their practical uses, the market for energy storage as it currently is, and maybe some, some future markets, as well as programs and financing that are currently available. So energy storage is a technology that operates just as its name suggests. It stores energy generated typically from another source, such as an on-site generator or charging directly from the grid, uh, for use at another time. There are several types of energy storage available today. The most popular is electrochemical storage. Uh, most commonly, we know those as batteries, which are growing in popularity, likely because of the wide variety of battery storage systems that are on the market today, and they're progressively lowering costs. Other examples of storage include mechanical, such as a flywheel, which stores kinetic energy, and thermal energy storage, which is used for heating and cooling purposes through a variety of different methods. So these are some photos that give you an idea of what an installed energy storage system looks like. These photos are of actual installations here in the San Diego territory that we've taken for the SGIP. As you can see, they range in size depending on their capacity and configuration. Starting in the bottom left-hand corner, we see a home installation, and that energy storage system is about the size of a small refrigerator. As we work clockwise around, we see increasingly larger systems than commercial uses. Go anywhere from a small cabinet to the bottom right-hand corner, which is about the size of a shipping container. Energy storage is appealing to folks for several different reasons. Its locational flexibility means that it's available to virtually any customer and can provide specific benefits based on where it is installed. Declining costs also make storage more accessible to customers than ever, and the ability to control its use to charge and discharge at different times when it is most beneficial is particularly appealing to customers. This flexibility allows customers to better meet their z and &E goals as well. Most storage is not dependent on weather or the time of day in order to operate, which is also appealing uh, if you have PV on site, it's only operating when the sun is out, but with storage, you're able to leverage those capabilities much easier. With any technology, there are some disadvantages to consider. There is a certain level of degradation that does occur with energy storage that is dependent on the different energy storage technology and how often and long the storage system discharges. Also, there is a possibility of a net increase on the load due to charging and discharging at certain times and with certain round-trip efficiency losses. The market for energy storage is still emerging, so costs have not yet leveled out. The technology as a whole is still reliant on incentives to be a viable option for many customers. Customers should also consider the maintenance that is required to keep the system operating at prime functioning. A big barrier we see in the market today is a challenge in educating customers on the many uses of energy storage beyond a backup only or off-grid use. Also, regulatory processes may be, hurting, or may be creating hurdles on the deployment of energy storage as agencies work to streamline processes and permitting and tap into the wide variety of value streams that energy storage has to offer. 
So what is the driving energy storage here in the state of California? Well, that really depends on who you ask. Foundationally, the state's motivation is mainly an environmental one. Energy storage contributes to, de contributes to decreased greenhouse gas reductions by enabling increased renewable integration on the grid. By using the storage for load shifting, customers can better close that gap that is preventing them from achieving their ZNE goals. At a utility and grid operator level, storage placed in strategic locations on the grid has the ability to defer transmission and distribution upgrades and avoids the need for utilities to invest in peaker plants that operate only a small portion of the year. And at the utility customer level, on-site energy storage can offset load and reduce electricity costs, primarily demand charges, and increase service reliability for critical infrastructure. Energy storage is growing rapidly in popularity with residential customers. Many homeowners are still looking for the security that a backup battery can provide in the event of a power outage, and others are looking even forward in the future for markets that are emerging where they can participate in demand response programs and, if they're on a time of use rate, uh, participate in load shifting. The commercial market currently offers more diverse benefits to customers. Integrating storage can help extend the life of the current grid infrastructure by providing specific locational benefits to customers. Additionally, demand response programs allow customers to use their energy storage to discharge at times the grid needs it most, while earning money back for the customer. Utility procurement programs are also on the horizon. While we see the costs are dropping, this nascent technology is still somewhat dependent on external funding. The self-generation program is one of the longest-running incentive programs in the country and has incentivized distributed generation technology since 2001. The SGIP provides cash incentives for the installation of clean and efficient distributed generation and storage technologies installed on the customer side of the utility meter. It is utility ratepayer funded and overseen by the California Public Utility Commission. The SGIP recently relaunched with replenished budget and new rules geared primarily toward energy storage. And the program provides rebates for a variety of customer-sided distributed storage systems. The SGIP also plays a key role in realizing the goals of AB 2514. I really like this graph. It does a, a great job, I think, of showing the popularity of different technologies throughout the life of the program. So this particular graph shows the number of applications that the project or the program has received statewide from 2001 to 2016. As you can see, solar PV and internal combustion engines were the primary technologies in the early years of the program. And from 2001 to 2007, we saw the solar PV grow exponentially to the point where it received its own incentive program in 2007 through the California Solar Initiative. We see a, t a similar trend with energy storage beginning in 2010 through 2016. You can see in 2016 that we had the most number of applications received statewide in any year for energy storage. And that was a unique year that we opened and closed in one day and fully subscribed all of our funding. So as I mentioned, we've reopened in 2017 under new rules with over $50 million in funds that were available in step one on, on May 1st, which we fully subscribed within 10 days. And then we opened again with our step two funding of over $117 million for energy storage. So this graph shows you, based on those two steps and the money that we had available, how many projects we've received since May 1st to date in the program. So it's quite a bit. We have 809 large-scale energy storage that are currently under review or receiving funds in the program, and almost double that for small energy storage, which is really phenomenal to see how, how much growth we're seeing in the market. This is a huge step for the market, and we're excited to see these new programs and policies emerge to support the technology. This gives you a better idea of just capacity-wise what we're seeing in the program, and so we're still seeing a lot of two- to three-hour batteries. Oops. Just to close out, I would like to just mention a few items that we have that are on the horizon for energy storage. So the S-chip is not the end of the road. Looking forward past S-chip, we've got SB 700, which is currently under consideration, that proposes a more holistic approach to a market transformation program for storage, which includes a carve-out for low-income and disadvantaged communities. This program, if it's approved, would also include more robust education and outreach opportunities that are not currently in the SGIP, but there is a strong appetite for. 
Also, the California Public Utility Commission is exploring multiple use applications for energy storage, such as demand response and demand reduction programs. As you can tell, it is quite an exciting time in the field as new opportunities arise and the technologies develop. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. That was great, informative, and if anybody has any specific questions about the SGIP program or something related, please type that into the chat box. Next, we're going to move on to hear from Mike Hopkins and Claude McGee regarding the Palm Springs Cultural Center's Solar Plus Storage Project that they put on. So we're going to kick that off with a well-done video that they were able to put together. So give us one moment. Great. So, Claude, it is all yours. Okay. You can... There we go. Um... So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Claude McGee. I, I head up uh, commercial sales at Horizon Solar Power. Um, as you'll hear a little later on uh, in my little chat, and, and when you hear from Mike, we, we did that project in Palm Springs, and we'll get into more details on that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how solar uh, affects the electricity bill um, and, and how excited we are about storage in the various formats. Um, can you go to the next slide for me? So uh, who is Horizon? Um, we are one of the largest um, solar companies in, in California, especially on the residential side. We've done over 7,000 California installations. Um, we do residential and commercial. Uh, we are number one in, in the SCE market and number four in all of California. Um, I won't go through all of this. I know you guys can read. Um, but. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're, we're very large on the residential side. The commercial side, which I head up, is a little smaller, but we're growing very quickly. Um, we are, our residential side is headquartered in Temecula, and the commercial side is headquartered in Hemet, California. And we build commercial solar arrays anywhere from 50 kilowatts up to, up to 3 megawatts. Um, from a financing perspective, um, we're, we're agnostic. We don't push a customer in any one direction. Um, we use PACE a lot, uh, different types of leases. Some of my customers go for banks, uh, PPAs, especially with nonprofits. We often do uh, power purchase agreements. Um, we work in multiple um, uh, industries, um, but we've done a lot of work of late with hotels, mobile home parks. Uh, just got PTO on an HOA here in, in, uh, in San Diego area this morning. Uh, we do a lot of work with nonprofits. Um, we do build all over uh, California. We're just finishing a project up in uh, Placerville. Um, but our main focus is, is here in Southern California. Um, the technology as well, and that's something that we're going to talk about uh, on today's call. Um, we're, we are technology ag agnostic. Um, we'll use whatever the best mods we can get, modules, inverters, and energy, of, energy storage, of course, is, is sort of the new frontier um, that uh, we're, we're, we're very excited about. And we realize that with every passing week, um, energy storage in, in its different formats is going to become a, a larger and larger part of what we do um, as we partner with 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 uh, storage companies. Um, and you know, it's just whatever's the best fit for the customer. Uh, so, can you hit the next slide? Uh, so, this is you know, solar power, right? Solar power is great at offsetting energy charges. Um, the, the one of the big challenges is the demand charge, and I'll get into that in a moment. We're going to show you a a commercial electricity bill, and I can show kind of a before and after solar, and you can see quite well um, how energy storage comes into play. My customers, um, we really talk about the money. Uh, we don't talk a lot about, you know, environmental goals. I, I think if I went in and talked about environmental goals more often than not, I'd be thrown out of my ear. Uh, I go in and talk about how I can save the customer money, um, and that's something that all business owners want to hear. Uh, the, you know, other things that energy storage, of course, you know, you can use it as backup power at night. Um, you can use it um, to, 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 to uh, try to reduce the demand charges. And then, of course, uh, non-bypassable charges. Uh, and the other side, you know, especially with the project that you'll hear about with, with the Palm Springs project, um, you know, it just makes the most sense for customers to look to, to reduce um, their overall energy usage and then replace with solar. Um, so that we're going to go through all that in a moment. Can you hit the next slide? So 
this is the way, uh, I don't know how, how familiar all of you are. This might be sort of brand new to some of you, and you may have, some of you may already know about this, but the utilities charge commercial customers in three buckets. Um, if you look at the right side of this little graph where it says charges at the top, you've got other, energy, and demand. Um, the other charge, uh, this customer is on a Southern California Edison time of use uh, 8, and they're on the option CPP. Um, their other charge is 635 per month, um, so that's 7619 per year. The energy charge, this is a time of use energy charge, so they charge you one price in the winter for mid-peak per kilowatt hour, they charge you another price in the off-peak per kilowatt hour, and then of course in the summertime you have the same thing with on-peak pricing, off-peak pricing, and mid-peak pricing. But that's your energy charge. So this particular customer's energy charge is 280780 per year. Uh, the demand charge, and, and so, so let me go back to that real quick. The energy charge, this is great for net energy metering. Um, you know, as long as we're offsetting a big portion of their bill, um, you know, we know how much sunlight is going to hit these solar panels over the course of a year uh, on average using historical weather data. Um, demand charge, however, um, this is the one that, 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 that's hardest to offset with solar power uh, because the demand charge is based on 15-minute increments. So the utility literally looks through a, a customer's usage and they look for the 15-minute period that the customers demand, that the customer use the most power. And they offset, sorry, they, 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 that's where the demand charge comes from. So this particular customer is not too bad. I often see customers where demand charge is 60% of their bill, energy charge at 35% of the bill, and then the other charge. Um, this customer demand charge is 179,302, so it's probably you know 30% of this customer's bill. Uh, so this is a this is a typical this is a typical commercial rate. This is true in San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, this is true in SCE, PG&E. Um, everybody basically has these three buckets. Your other bucket your energy charge bucket and your demand charge bucket. Uh, can you hit the next slide? So you'll notice this is your after solar. Um, after they've gone solar, we tell customers you need to switch to the option R rate tariff. Uh, in, in Southern California Edison, it's option R. This is the solar friendly rate tariff. Um, in San Diego Gas and Electric, it's DGR, which is also their version of the solar friendly rate tariff. Uh, so after a customer goes solar, you notice the other charge remains the same, um, 7619 it's 635 per month, so that doesn't change. Uh, the next bucket is a new bucket. This is because of NEM 2.0. Uh, these are non-bypassable charges. Now in this case, so this, this is a charge that's charged on electricity that goes back out into the grid. So, uh, you know, say on it, on, you know, just to use easy easy numbers, let's say Saturday the business is closed and the, the solar array is creating power um, and that power is going back out into the grid and being used by the neighbor, maybe a customer next door. Um, uh, and, and so there's a small charge that is put on each kilowatt hour that goes back out into the grid. Um, you know, the utility does have that grid infrastructure that's being used uh, and so they charge the customer for that. Um, it, it was interesting, you know, uh, when sort of when the 30% tax credit was potentially uh, going away uh, and when NEM 2.0 was looming, uh, everybody in the solar industry was, was kind of freaking out. We were like, oh, my goodness, this is going to change everything. We're all going to have to get new jobs. Um, the 30% tax credit didn't, didn't end up going away. And NEM 2.0, there is an extra charge here, but it's not nearly as significant as we all thought. Um, but, um, you know, obviously things like batteries can help with, non, with these non-bypassable charges. So that's one of the potential uh, benefits uh, of, having demand char of having battery, excuse me, or, or energy storage along with uh, having um, solar on your roof. So you'll notice that the, the energy charge is, is significantly reduced, but there's still quite a bit left. Uh, in, in this case, it was because we didn't really have enough room. Um, this is not the Palm Springs project. Sorry, this was an example that I pulled from another customer. Um, but we didn't really have enough space to offset their entire bill. So, um, you know, they've got significant reduction in the energy charge 
bill, in the energized portion of the bill, excuse me. But we still have, you know, a pretty significant bill there. Um, so, you know, 131, 330 remaining on the energy charge. Now, had we had more space, we probably would have made a bigger system. Um, the demand charge, can you go back to the other slide for me real quick? I just want to see how much each each went. So 131, 330, it was 287.80, right? So you've got significant reduction there. Uh, the demand charge is still $103,966. So this customer is saving 86000 $86, almost $87,000, but they still have a significant uh, remaining bill, some of that with demand charge and some of that with energy charge and then of course the non-bypassable charges and the other charge. So long story short, in residential you're, you're able to, to basically offset someone's whole bill. You know, I have solar at my house and um, I pay 10 bucks a month to the utility. Uh, in, in the commercial world, um, there's basically no, almost no situation where I'm able to do that for a customer. There's always remaining charges. Uh, the other charge, of course, remains. Uh, you've got non-bypassable charges that always remain. Uh, there's Sometimes I'm actually able to offset the entire energy charge bucket. I'm able to basically get rid of that. Uh, and then the last bucket, the demand charge, I'm, I'm really almost never able to wipe that whole thing out. Uh, so the customers always see great savings, but I end up having to, to go in and explain to the customer, look, you're going to have this much remaining with the utility. And, and one of the ways um, to, to try to work on that a, a, even farther is different types of, 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 uh, of energy storage. Uh, can you go to the next slide for me? There we go. So this actually was the Palm Springs Cultural Center. Um, the, the picture on the right was our initial um, recommendation for them because we needed all of this solar to offset their entire bill. And basically their whole bill was, was air conditioning. Uh, there's, you know, there's lighting and, and of course and stuff, but it's basically all air conditioning. It's very hot in Palm Springs. Uh, so we wanted to come in with this massive solar system. Uh, but the customer was reluctant, didn't really want to do that much solar, didn't really want to cover their whole parking lot um, and just, just go sort of whole hog, for lack of a better way to put it, um, on, on the solar piece. And so um, we teamed up um, with Ice Energy, and basically Ice Energy, and uh, Mike will go into greater detail of his technology with Ice Energy there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we, so basically what we did is, is they took the electricity bill, and Ice Energy modeled how their technology was going to re reduce the customer's electricity bill. So then we had a, a new kilowatt hour number that we then made as much solar as we could. So this was a true reduce first type of project, reduce the usage, and then of course, you know, go solar. Now the customer I'm sure is still gonna have some electricity bill. We're not wiping out the whole thing, but we're saving them a lot of money uh, with the combination of, of, of our solar array plus Ice Energy's technology. Um, so the, the, the customer is, is they're, they're really, they're great folks and they're really excited about, about uh, both Ice Energy as well as, um, as well as Horizon Solar Power. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and, and let Mike take the, uh, take the reins here uh, and talk about his technology and how, how that combined uh, with solar to uh, make, make for a happy customer. Thanks, Claude. Ali, I assume you'll switch decks here. Yes, one, one moment. Second. So it's on. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you on this webinar. I might start before just jumping into our technology and the Palm Springs project, which is definitely a very special, uh, interesting project, to just talk about zero net energy and energy storage and what I want to address there is energy efficiency used to be the the big standard for commercial industrial customers as well as residential and over time that evolved to zero net carbon and now zero net energy all of which are important and, and valuable goals but I would argue that in the in the, in the new world 
of the evolving, the quickly evolving grid. In places where renewables are successful, like Hawaii and California, and hopefully far, far more broadly than that, zero net energy, not even zero net energy, I would say, is adequate. We're going into a world where the success of renewables is fundamentally changing the way the grid operates. And we're moving off of that traditional midday peak, which was actually a relatively manageable load for the grid as it's currently designed pretty much across the United States. And we're moving into a new, more volatile, uh, more uncertain world where we're moving from that traditional peak to a deck curve. And from there, not totally clear where we're headed next other than things change quickly when renewables get onto the grid. But if you look at just the significance of the duck curve, the significance of the duck curve with its actual over generation during what was the traditional midday peak, and then this very steep, much steeper ramp up kind of early evening, late afternoon, early evening, has created a, a problem that isn't actually fully resolved by zero net energy goals, even if we all adopted that and actually all were successful in that. So we're, we're getting to a place where one thing we'll have to be able to do, and this is the significance of energy storage, is it's not just good enough to produce renewable energy. It's not, just, it's not good enough to be efficient in how we use that renewable energy. What we're going to have to be able to do right at the building level is to be able to control when we use electricity and to control when we don't use electricity. Uh, that is something the grid itself is trying to deal with, but clearly isn't able to deal with it in the time required. And the symptom of that is negative prices. You're seeing negative prices. And that's certainly affecting renewables. And I'd say the future of renewables is it has to overcome that because if energy is priced as negative, it's actually not valuable. It's a cost to the grid. And that's, that's clearly not what we want renewable to be. We don't want it, renewables to be perceived as a cost as opposed to a benefit. And energy storage is instrumental in turning that around, in, in making the renewables valuable, in giving buildings and homeowners the ability to control when they use electricity, when they don't use electricity, and effectively flatten their own duck curve and have this very, very manageable load that fully values the renewable energy and enables that full displacement of fossil fuels. Alia, you can go to the next slide, which I think will be just a little introduction to, to us. So Ice Energy, we're a thermal energy storage company. We've been around a relatively long time for the storage business. Uh, we're 14 years old now. And we've been, I would say, a pioneer in using thermal energy storage, specifically distributed thermal energy storage, as a grid resource, as opposed to just a building resource. So Ice Energy has been very active and one of the early leaders in aggregating our systems and getting utilities to pay for, and actually not just pay for, but to adopt our systems, the aggregated systems, as a regular grid resource to fix real grid problems like congestion, to avoid the need for gas peakers and the like. We're headquartered in Santa Barbara, uh, but we uh, have offices down further south in Costa Mesa and Riverside. And our whole focus is on uh, taking what has historically been the biggest problem with the electricity grid, which is their air, their air conditioning load, the peakiest part, and literally turning that air conditioning load by the use of our systems into very simple, very reliable, and maybe most importantly, very low cost energy storage. And to be able to do that very quickly, uh, which that, that idea of quick, easy, simple, cost-effective energy storage is critically important to the evolving grid as I described it earlier. Go to the next slide. 
So our systems, which I'll describe in a little more detail, but I, I'll, I'll start with why would you consider thermal batteries as opposed to electrochemical batteries, given electrochemical batteries are obviously more well-known and at this time more popular. It would start with low cost, uh, where you're able to use a thermal battery in place of an electrochemical battery, then it's lower cost. And it's lower cost by about half. If you look at a life cycle cost analysis of a lithium ion battery, that's gonna be about twice as much as a thermal battery, like one of our ice bear systems. The cost of our system has become so low that if you, again, go from the building level and start thinking about, well, what if I aggregated a whole lot of these systems it's actually less than a gas peaker, which a lot of people would consider the holy grail. If you can get energy storage to be actually cheaper than traditional utility infrastructure, that's where you reach that tipping point of energy storage fundamentally changing the grid and, and enabling this more distributed grid rather than a centralized one. Our systems are reliable. They're reliable because they're simple. Uh, they, in our case, they've been around a long time, so we've got a lot of units that have logged a lot of hours. And in our case, they make and melt ice. So they do what they're supposed to do, and they do it reliably. Very environmentally friendly. It's just water, literally tap water filled once. They last a long time, uh, about 20 years. Um, and we are unique, at least compared to uh, uh, electrochemical batteries, and we have no degradation, absolutely no degradation whatsoever over the entire 20-year life. Very high efficiency. It's 85% round trip, but if you operate them in the traditional way of making ice in the evening or nighttime, and then using it in the heat of the day, you actually can exceed, and I think Andy referred to this, you can actually ex exceed 100% efficiency, or at least apparent efficiency, taking advantage of the uh, efficiency of making cooling at night. Um, last but not least, uh, we do good things in the communities that we operate. Our, our systems are designed to be uh, installed, actually not by us, but by just regular HVAC companies. They're designed to be maintained by the same companies that installed them. So when we come into a community and undertake projects using our systems, we're hiring a lot of local people and buying local equipment and generally doing good things for the community go to the next slide. This is our main product. Uh, it's the product used, by the way, at the uh, Palm Springs project. It's our, it's our product designed for commercial industrial buildings called the Ice Bear 30. It's been out in operation now for about eight years. And it operates like a true thermal battery. Uh, this is a system that is a, an addition to the common rooftop air conditioner and it's designed to be a battery for that air conditioner. Uh, in this case, typically, it's gonna be one of our ice bears connected to 10 tons of air conditioning, and that will provide a three-hour storage resource uh, so that it's gonna be making ice whenever you want it to make ice, and then when you do not wanna use electricity but still cool the building, the ice bear, either because it was scheduled to do this or you go in in real time, they're all networked, and our system will turn off the air conditioner and will cool the building just by melting the ice, which uses about 5% of what the air conditioners would have been using if they were trying to cool the building in real time at that point in time. We can go to the next slide. A newer product we have is called the Ice Bear 20. Uh, it, can be put into commercial situations, small commercial situations. It's more commonly uh, placed in residential situations. We've got actually over 200 of these. This was just announced last week. 200 of these systems are going to the island of Nantucket. This system you can think of in some respects as a, a downsized version of the commercial system. The fundamental difference is it actually isn't just a thermal battery, it's an actual replacement of the conventional air conditioner. So this is designed to literally replace the conventional air conditioner of a home or a small commercial setting. It's a high efficiency unit uh, if you just test it as a conventional air conditioner and 
that's by the way how it would operate most of the time. It's got a compressor like an air conditioner, it'll cool the air like an air conditioner, and it'll cool the home or the building like an air conditioner, and it'll do that while it's operating normally and score, we just got this done by an independent lab, for just over 14 and a half SEER rating. We call that direct cooling mode. It's operating like a normal air conditioner. Unlike a normal air conditioner, it has an ice tank. And when it's not, op when it's not cooling the building, it's using that same compressor to make ice. And that gives it the ability for four hours to stop operating completely. The compressor actually shuts off when you want to cool without using electricity. And it then just melts the ice. When it's doing that, like the other one, it's using only 5% of the energy. This is just to run the pump. And it's providing all the cooling you need for four hours. You go to the next slide. This is our latest product. This is purely residential. Uh, this is uh, like the one you just saw, the Ice Bear 20. It, it is, again, a replacement of a conventional home air conditioner. This one for a smaller home. Has the addition of heating, and maybe most relevant to this conversation we're having, it actually replaces, um, it, it's actually able to run with solar. Um, we can make ice in just four hours and fully make a uh, tank of ice. Once we've done that, we will be able to then provide ice cooling for another four hour period. You can go to the next slide. This project is, I, I put this up here just as an earlier project of ice bears and solar. This was our first one. Um, this was a big, big box retailer in uh, Reading. This was an example where they already had solar and they thought they'd be happy with solar and they were happy with solar, but it was inadequate. Uh, this was a, uh, uh, because it was a big box retailer, they had a lot of people uh, needing air conditioning late in the day when they came after work. So the solar was good for keeping things running during the day, but their most intensive use was actually when the solar was dissipating. So by the addition of ice bears, they were able to uh, be able to make ice during that solar period and then cool the building with ice rather than using electricity from the grid and achieved a flatter load, which you see in yellow, uh, relative to what they had there before, either you know, before solar or once they got the solar in. Go to the next slide we will go to our most interesting project. And I'd say it, this is the most interesting project we've ever done at a building level, the Camelot Theater Project. Uh, as Claude, I think, already touched on, in this case, we have a, a building that's, they're doing a major renovation. They're wanting to be energy efficient, but like everybody else, they're wanting to control costs. They've got an unusual building profile that turned out to be, I'd say, quite ideal for the combination of solar and ice, even though that might not be obvious. But their profile is one of uh, very intensive air conditioning load, but barely any of that during the day. And great sun being in Palm Springs during the day, and obviously none at night. If you go to the next slide. So we came in with Horizon and came up with a solution that makes, I'd say, full possible use of solar for a building that really has almost no load uh, during the solar period um, and brings in storage to make full use of that solar and to deliver the full benefit of that solar when there is load. And to do it in a way that I'd say was quite extraordinarily economic because of how tightly we modeled and designed the interplay of the storage and the solar so that the storage was effectively being charged completely with the solar, which enabled us to not only get self-generation incentive program funding, which we generally get any time in California we're doing a, uh, an ice bear project because we're an advanced energy storage project, 
But in this case, the customer was able to get the investment tax credit because of the fact that the making of the ice was really all being done during the solar charge period. Um, in this case, we were able to also work with Horizon to uh, give them pretty much all the roof space and we put the ice bears down on the ground and uh, ran lines up to the roof where the air conditioners were, which by the way is a very common way to install and is obviously ideal when we're partnering with a solar company that wants to uh, use as much of the roof space as is available for the solar where the solar has to go. You can go to the next slide. This is a economic analysis of the cost of the project and the benefit looking just purely at the economics, which as Claude mentioned is oftentimes the only thing that a customer is going to consider. And this shows uh, really two scenarios, one where the, uh, on the right the customer could have gone ahead and done what they were thinking of doing, which is just replace their failing air conditioners. On the video I think you heard the uh, manager of the cultural center talking about the air conditioners were failing as is common there because they're so intensely used and they were having to look at a significant investment to replace the uh, all the air conditioners and they were looking at what would not be a very attractive payback and by the way when you're just replacing air conditioners it is really hardly ever an attractive payback it's just something people do because they have to to avoid losing the air conditioner functionality completely. Uh, what we were able to do with Horizon was to come up with a, a, a combination of the solar and ice, taking advantage of the benefits of the solar, the benefits of energy storage, in our case ice storage, the available rebates, the available tax credits, to turn a project that would have been not really much of a payback, I'd say more just a cost and turn it into a really great investment. In this case, it's got a simple payback of four years, which by, I would say, pretty much anyone's standards is an attractive payback. I would say beyond that, what we've enabled the Palm Springs Cultural Center to do is they now not only have their own renewable energy, they now have their own energy storage. And the energy storage is the flexible piece of that that certainly will be able to store the renewable energy, but can it can store any other energy? It's not hardwired in. It can be making ice whenever that customer desires based on whatever happens. Right now, this is definitely the way to do it, where we're making ice during the solar period and taking full benefit of that solar. In the future, when loads change and rates change, and there may be different incentives and different penalties, the Palm Springs Cultural Center is going to be well armed to be able to fully control their own load and resources and be able to best uh, take advantage and monetize their solar and be able to best take advantage and monetize their energy storage. And that's, I think, a good place for me to stop. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike and Claude. That was a really great presentation. And we will transition right in to hearing from Steve and Chad regarding the Poway Unified School Districts and the Green Charge Network technology and give us one moment while we switch over. Great. Thanks so much for uh, pulling that up. Um, this is uh, Steve Kelly from Green Charge Networks, and we are fortunate today to have Chad as well from Poway Unified School District. And we are going to talk about how battery storage technology and solar can benefit um, commercial clients. Um, and so why don't I just dive into this, and we'll go to the next slide. So briefly, I'll talk a little bit about who um, Green Charge Networks is, and then we're going to go into a case study with Poway Unified School District. So on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about us. Um, and the slide deck should just be moving over one second. It might just be uh, delayed. 
But Green Charge Networks is one of the largest energy storage providers in, in the world. Um, we are owned by NG, which is the Sorry. largest. Sorry. One moment. I think we're having some technical difficulties as far as what slide people can see. Give me one moment. Great. I can see the main slide right now. Perfect. I think that looks great. Okay, great. Um, as I was saying, that we are a division of NG, which is one of the largest energy storage companies in the world. We have deployed hundreds of projects um, in commercial, public sector, schools, colleges um, across the country. Um, and um, as you look at this, I think it's, it's important to, to really see how that's grown over the last six or seven years. So why don't I keep moving along here? What, what do we do and what should people be looking for in an energy storage solution provider? Um, first of all is I think some of the most important aspects of any of this is really understanding what is the right size energy storage system to put into the building. How do you pair it with renewable energy? If you're looking for a net zero solution, how do you size that appropriately with the generation? Because as many of you know, most forms of generation have some intermittency um, there are some baseload technologies like um, natural gas or fuel cells, but they can't handle the peaks. So if you're looking to provide a net zero solution, you really want something with flexible storage that can help you get there. And sizing it appropriately and understanding the right infrastructure is critical. What most people also are looking for is we have about a 50% mix in finance solutions versus cash purchases. Um, the finance solution that we see most adopted here in California is under a shared savings model where the owner of the, the financier would own and operate the asset so the customer would not have to pay any funds and they would share the savings. And I would say that's, that's probably, like I said, just over 60% of, of all of our clients in the past have gone forward with that type of approach. And the other key thing is how do you build, construct, uh, manage the, that whole process on, on behalf of the client. And then really, I think one of the key point is, is how do you operate this? Because over a 10 year period, and, and these now are moving to 15 and 20 year life cycles, um, you really want someone who knows how to operate this effectively uh, and your software, because there are many things that are changing in the California utility tariff structure. You want a very flexible and smart solution that, that can be adaptive. So if I move to the next slide here, um, what are some of those services that gen generate revenue? And it looks like we've got a mix of commercial as well as some utility folks on the line. So our business really is split up on two sides. One is on the commercial side where our systems provide revenue or savings from peak demand shaving, from arbitrage, which is where you charge the batteries when energy is cheaper and you discharge them when it's more expensive. We also do a lot of demand response with our, with our batteries, and this could be um, conjunctive with uh, load shedding that the building's already doing, or are doing and using the excess capacity of our batteries, as well as reliability. We're seeing more and more requirements for people wanting backup solutions or run, being able to run these and just use the grid as backup. Because if you're in a net zero situation, that's pretty much what you'd be doing um, for that. For our utility customers, we offer a whole set of services there um, which generate value for them both at the utility or at the ISO level. Primarily those are um, the, the services you see here, but given this I think is mainly a commercial audience, I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So who are some of the customers that are using this? It's, it's a broad mix. For someone as small as a 7-Eleven that's got a 45 kilowatt load, to someone like Cal State Fullerton that has a nine megawatt load, energy storage fits a lot of different solutions. Um, and so it's a broad mix and it's one that um, I think is pretty exciting to see the adoption. And a lot of that's been helped driven by the SGIP incentive program, um, which is uh, now open and, and think it has been doubled in size this year and is really creating a lot of demand for the industry. So I'll keep going to the next slide. So what do some of these installations look like? Um, it's a broad mix of system sizes. 
So a starting size system for commercial is usually about a 30 kilowatt, 60 kilowatt hour system. The 30 kilowatts is the inverter size, so that's the maximum amount of energy you can put out. And the 60 kilowatt hours is the amount of battery capacity. So the system kind of on the lower right-hand side there would be that size. Some of these other units are a 250-500 unit. Um, that's probably their most popular size. They fit in about half a parking spot. Um, and it's able to generate 250 kilowatts of peak demand shaving, which uh, usually is about fifty to $60,000 in savings per year um, with that type of system. Going on to the next slide. Um, I think many of you have, and it was brought up earlier, so I'll go quickly through this, that as companies are trying to figure out how to be more efficient, how to go net zero, how to offset their bill, there's a requirement of obviously on-site generation, but also how do I reduce peak demand or store energy later? And many folks have tried energy efficiency or solar, and it's been able to offset a portion of their bill, but really the, the challenge for most folks have been the demand side. So if you go to the next slide, for those of you who may not be aware of a commercial bill, there's really two parts of your bill. One of which is the amount of electricity you use, which is if you turn on a light bulb, you pay for how much electricity you use. The other part of your bill is the demand charge or kilowatt portion of your bill. And this is the one highest 15 minute interval in the month, which you get billed for. And in many times now in California, we're seeing this represent more than 50% of the electric bill for commercial clients. So it's a key area that's increasing on average almost 9% per year as a blended average across all three investor-owned utilities in the state. And it's one in which most energy managers are focused on reducing. So if you go to the next slide, we can see how these increases are that I mentioned, and they do vary by utility. Um, and there's good reason why many times they do this, because energy costs are dropping, they're having to put infrastructure in, there's an impact to renewable energy, and so it's an important part that the utility needs to be able to charge in order to still, you know, earn revenue. Um, and we do expect that this will continue um, going forward. So going to the next slide. How does this actually work? So this happens to be a load profile of one of our commercial clients, and this is the spike in volatility that you see. So one of the first things we do is after installing a system, it's fully charged to start the day, and our software automatically predicts what is the maximum load that the utility wants to see. So if you see in this chart right here, the orange line is what the load profile was without our system, the new green line is the new load profile from what the utility sees. And the difference between the top of that orange line to the green line is the amount of demand charge savings that we've created. And so by changing this load, you're able to save a significant monthly amount for that customer. And many of you probably are aware that the time of use rate tariffs are changing, where they used to be noon to six and they're getting pushed out to later in the evening, even up to potentially 10 p.m. So being able to change and adjust on the fly is, is a critical piece that you want to understand in any type of investment I think you, you want to make in your buildings. So that's a real simple way in which you can see how the system creates peak demand shaving um, and maximizes the use of the battery. If you go to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about how when you combine it with, with solar and sustainability um, as, as the key part of this discussion today is really about getting to net zero. I think one of the most critical pieces of battery technology for energy storage is the flexibility of it to charge, store, and dispatch energy um, depending on when the building load is. And it's not required as just one um, load source but it can be incredibly flexible as to how to store that electricity from solar or fuel cells or um, natural gas and, and be able to use that most effectively. I think the other key thing is, is not only by going net zero, but you're also able to reduce your electric bill significantly. Um, many times too, we see energy storage coming in to solve issues with power quality. So if you have a, um, Cogen facility, we've seen situations where a cogen facility is operating and there happens to be a voltage sag in the line from the utility and it shuts off the um, cogen facility. 
Well, obviously it takes a while for that to restart and create some havoc for, for this particular customer. So by putting in energy storage, we can inject voltage into the line to increase it and not have that cogen facility trip off line. There's some other areas that we see a lot more now common are backup power and resiliency or using the technology for demand response programs in order to minimize the impact of uh, something like today, if you're in California where we have a high heat day and we've used a lot of electricity, we're getting calls for energy at key times that, that we can dispatch from the batteries and the utility is paying for that service. So it's not only savings, but also a way to generate revenue. One of the other nice things is uh, by doing so, um, you're able to use battery storage to reduce the amount of gas peakers or in other markets, coal facilities, um, which is a cleaner version of energy by charging with solar and not using the gas peaker plants. So uh, I think what I like most about it, though, is, is the economics of when you combine solar and storage together. It's really a one plus one equals three. And these projects become more financially attractive um, as you combine them together, which we'll see in the next slide. So this happens to be a customer in the Central Valley. It's a pretty good load. It's got about 1.6 um, megawatts of load. And we first looked at adding in um, about a 1.8 megawatt solar system. And that blue curve is what the new load curve is for that site just with solar. And that created about $42,000 in savings through a PPA. Well, the customer said this is great, but my demand charges are, are almost 60% of my total bill. How can I reduce that? So the solar provider and, I, and us came together and we installed a uh, one megawatt, two megawatt hour battery storage system. And we were able to almost double the amount of savings that were generated for that client. And as you can see here, for this particular month, we were able to reduce their demand from 1.8 megawatts to just below a megawatt, creating about $37,000 in savings. So the customer who had originally installed solar now got twice the savings and really created a load profile that was optimized um, to create the most amount of savings for that client. And this made this project significantly more attractive to them uh, as well as to their shareholders. So this is the, uh, like I said, one plus one equals three. If you go to the next slide, you can see uh, some other areas that we see quite a bit. So this happens to be a school district up here in the um, Bay Area. And you can see here, this is a picture from their portal that they get to look at you by utilizing your system. The orange is the load profile um, with, uh, is, the, is the standard load profile. The green is the new load profile when you have solar and storage. Now what you can see here is, is usually when it's sunny out and the solar's producing, which is why you get those big gaps right in the middle of the day going down, is the solar's producing and it's, it's net metering. So it's offsetting 100% of the load that the building's using. And we're just shaving off the mornings and the afternoons, which is the, that orange area um, that is created savings by the energy storage system. But when you get cloud cover, which happens right about you know, two-thirds of the way over, you'll see those big spikes in the middle of the day where the cloud is. This generated about um, $4,000 in cost in demand charges for this particular school district. But the battery storage system was able to reduce that down to about 50 kilowatts, you know, saving them over $4,500 that month just in demand charges. So it's the intermittency of solar with cloud cover as well as backup and other uses that I think becomes really important um, by combining solar and storage. Going to the next slide, um, I think one of the most important things that most people want to look at is, you know, I, I don't want to have to deal with this. I want it to automatically work. I want it to be able to see and understand everything that's happening. Um, and that's, I think, really one of the most important things with any energy storage provider is the sophistication of their software. And it's not just being able to do peak demand shaving, but being able to do multiple different revenue streams. So for example, with one of our school districts at Hemet Unified School District, they were able to double the amount of savings by doing multiple revenue streams um, beyond peak demand shaving. So their savings went from about 
$220,000 a year to about $490,000 a year just by doing other services like arbitrage, switching tariffs to lower cost tariffs, and leveraging a demand response program. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, is, is really what I was just talking about here, um, is by adding these additional components, you are able to drive significant savings or new revenue on your behalf. Um, currently with the California S-chip on a cash purchase, uh, we're typically seeing paybacks in the three and a half to five years. So this tends to be very attractive. Um, also for our public sector clients who are looking for more of a 15-year product, um, a 250-500 unit installed in, in let's say SDG&E is typically generating about seven to eight hundred thousand dollars in savings over a ten-year term, and about one point four to one point six million dollars in savings over a fifteen-year term. So, these are big numbers that can drive real savings over over time. Going to the next slide, um, another thing that we have seen really grow is the need for um, electric car charging infrastructure, and if you install, and also not only just at workplaces, but DC fast chargers. So this happens to be, uh, I'll, I'll bring up the story since um, we're in San Diego, where we had a DC fast charger. It was a Nissan 50 uh, kilowatt DC fast charger, and a city had installed that, and the demand charges of doing so went up just about $2,000, just from the electric vehicle charging station. Well, clearly they couldn't charge their customers that much to charge their vehicles, so they came to us saying, hey, can you help? And we were able to install an energy storage system that reduced 100% of that additional demand, and they were able to roll out more DC fast chargers um, throughout their city to be able to uh, cost-effectively offer this service to clients. Um, and this is a, a great way as we are trying to electrify the grid and really get off fossil fuels that combining electric vehicle charging and energy storage on sites makes it much more economical and, and expedites the deployment of that technology. So that's a great area that we see a lot of growth as well. Going on to the next slide, um, I am going to move over to a case study. Um, and we're, we're very excited to have Poway Unified as one of our clients. Um, those systems have been running now for a couple of years. Um, and I think really their leadership of looking at and evaluating energy storage as part of their whole sustainability and energy goals was, was a couple of years ago um, very forthright and, and industry leading. So with that, I'm going to hand that over to Chad, who's going to give you a little bit of background about the project, the district, and the results from their system. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, again, as Steve said, my name is Chad Coster, and I'm the, uh, the Director of Facilities, uh, Maintenance, and Operations here at Poway Unified. Um, I came onto the district actually just not quite a year ago, so into July last year. So a lot of this project was, was underway. Um, and I think they've probably been working on it for a couple of years, but we're really now just kind of getting it all up, fully running, and we've really seen it for probably the last four months, uh, kind of in full operation. Uh, just kind of a, a quick overview of the district. Um, we're primarily lo we're located in uh, northern San Diego County, uh, and have about 36,000 uh, K-12 students in our district. Um, we've got 41 campuses, kind of a that we manage which includes 39 school sites and two administrative areas, uh, which equates to about 4 million uh, square foot in, uh, in building space. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, you know, as, as Steve mentioned, um, some of my predecessors and, and the district as a whole has been fairly aggressive in a lot of our energy projects uh, that really uh, tried to be uh, kind of on the front edge, both you know, out of necessity, uh, just to manage our bills, as well as um, really trying to, to see what's out there. Um, some of the things when we first were looking at this project, of course, was kind of trying to get an, an evaluation across the district of um, kind of what our, our dollar per square foot costs were uh, and really attack some of our higher use areas. Um, we've done several different things. We've got a, a variety, over time, a variety of solar projects that have gone in, um, both 
some we own, some that are uh, PPAs. Um, we've also, you know, kind of been long standing in, in how do we manage these demand charges and how do we do some of the energy storage. So obviously th this battery project was, was kind of the latest and greatest in that. Um, but we also do have some thermal storage. We have one of our uh, large high school and middle school combined campuses that has a uh, large thermal storage for uh, our heating and HVAC systems. So, um, one of the other things that we're looking at as well is is being able to have kind of energy dashboards that we can use for our schools so that they understand kind of at the site level what they're using, and so uh, and we'll be able to tie in uh, how the the battery systems work in that as well. So, all right. Uh, for this particular process, um, we looked at, at really all of our schools and kind of did a, a case study to figure out which ones would be the, the best ones to go forward with. Uh, we did evaluate um, early on combining solar with storage. Uh, and for the, the initial phase as we move forward, uh, we did not combine the two. Uh, we will look at that as we move forward. Um, but the sites that we ended up putting the battery storage on were our sites that did not already have uh, an existing uh, PPA solar contract. Um, uh, next, next slide. So this is just a, a screenshot here of, of what we see. Um, and this kind of correlates to a lot of the stuff Steve already showed you. Uh, but hey, what are the, the main benefits that we've been able to see at the district? Um, Again, we mentioned we went into, we signed the agreement uh, with Green Charge. It is a PPA, uh, so it's a shared savings agreement. Um, so from the school's standpoint, um, hey, really a low risk investment for us. Um, we get to see a, you know, quite a bit of the savings and, and benefit of it, but you know, we don't really own the, uh, the risk in it. And we did not, you know, where we really struggle is having the capital for the capital investment program as well. So. That, that merged well for us, and it, in addition to some of the stuff uh, Steve was talking about on how their program and how their uh, their company on the backside of it are able to manage the load, right? So they've got a fairly significant incentive to to minimize our, our peak uh, shavings as well, uh, and so that I don't have to deal with it. I've got enough to think about, and uh, I can go in and click on our system and see how it's working, and uh, which has been great, um, but I don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day management. Uh, has been really really good for us. Um, ultimately, we did have uh, 13 locations where we ended up uh, putting these uh, battery storage. Um, you know, I, I give Steve a hard time. It looks like every every time we look at this, the uh, the projected savings goes up, so that's that's good. Um, but we are hoping over the 10-year life of this to to save a little over a million and a half dollars um, in, in total savings. And it's really as we're running the system now, that's strictly off of um, our peak shavings. We are starting to look at uh, moving into, uh, hey, how do we leverage this a little bit more and take uh, advantage of some of the other incentives that are out there uh, as far as demand response and, and how do we participate in that a little more aggressively uh, as we move forward. And, and this gives us the flexibility to do that. Um, and Green Charge has really been a, a good partner for us as we move forward. Um, the other advantage that, that just from an operational standpoint, for me, that has been great is, is this dashboard has really given us a uh, real-time uh, view into how we're using our energies at each of our sites, and that's been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, one example, uh, you know, in fact, it was the school that's on the on the site here, Del Norte High School, we were getting this huge spike in the evening, and we didn't have any idea what the heck that was or what was causing it, um, but it was really <laughs> setting our peak demand um, you know, over over time. And it was when, one, the, the chiller plant was still operating, uh, but the coaches were running out and turning on all the, the field lights. And so we were getting this huge, huge peak. And so we were able to, to control that and, and just change some of our, our operating practices to, to reduce our bills. So uh, overall, you know, we've been really happy with the system so far. Um, and we look forward to, to continuing to, to leverage it and see what what are the opportunities we have in the future. So, with that, I will uh, I will turn it back over. Great, thank you so much to all the presenters. I think today's oh, and also here's one last slide where you can download that Poway Unified School District case study here. 
So thanks again. I think everyone did a really great job. We do have a couple minutes now for a Q&A session, so if everyone can just stay on the line. We've got about five minutes. Um, we do have quite a few questions in the chat box, um, so I will divvy those out to the different presenters. Um, our SGIP project manager does have to leave right at 10.30 promptly, and I'm not sure about the other presenters, but we'll get through as many as we can. So there are a couple questions in the chat box regarding if this presentation will be sent out, um, and it will be. It, this whole presentation has been recorded, and that will be sent out either later today or tomorrow. So to kick off the questions, Andy, can you talk a little bit about the, the range of sizes that you see as, from applicants in the SGIP program and perhaps where people can find some public data? Absolutely. Uh, so there is public data available, and I'm happy to provide guidance on how to access that. But to answer the original question, um, there's not, I would say, an average or a standard size that we see in SGIP. Historically, we only incentivize two-hour batteries um, for energy storage that expanded uh, within the past couple of years, the thermal energy storage. So we were seeing system size between 30 kilowatts and 60 kilowatts for a two-hour system um, over the past few years. However, now that uh, we do not have that two-hour requirement, we see non-residential systems ranging anywhere from five kilowatt hours up mm -hmm. to megawatt hours in size. So I wouldn't say that there is any standard size. Uh, but all of this information can be found on the statewide public report that's now updated in real time. And that can be accessed through the SGIP database at www.selfgenca.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, okay, Claude, I'm going to direct this one to you. We just had a quick question. If you can perhaps concisely um, explain the concept of the duck curve. Claude, are you still there? So oh, sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Um, a little hard to do concisely, but I actually <laughs> think that that Mike might do a better job on on the duck curve than I would. I'm I'm happy to do that. Do you want me to? That would be great. Please. Okay. Please sure. take away, Mike. Thank you. So the, the, the duck curve, I think I re referred to it when I was speaking, um, the traditional load curve that utilities see on the grid has been a, looks like a bell curve. And it reflects the fact that uh, there's not a whole lot of electricity consumption going on very early in the morning, nor is there a lot of electricity consumption going on uh, late in the evening and, or overnight. But there's a lot of energy consumption going on during the daytime and it traditionally has peaked in the middle of the day, and that's been the air conditioning load. It, that's what spikes up the most. So you see this, roughly speaking, bell curve. What's happened with the success of solar, uh, especially in residential areas, is you see a curve that people described as a duck curve. Um, and they, they call it that because the, uh, well, I'll tell you what's going on. What's going on with a lot of solar is the place where you would have had the, this bell curve, this peak, has actually been not only flattened and is not a peak, but is actually pushed right down. It's actually a dip. The so-called uh, back of the duck. There's this swooping back of a duck. So what's going on is not that there's people using elect less electricity because they're using actually increasing amounts of electricity, but it's been offset and in fact more than offset by solar generation. So the success of solar generation is fully meeting in places what would have been this spike in demand and creating an actual oversupply situation or it could look like negative demand. There's not enough demand for the amount of energy coming from solar. The new peak, and this is the called the neck of the duck that kind of swoops up and then levels off is you go from this period of overgeneration where the solar is peaking to a place where solar is dissipating, people are coming home from work, they're turning on their lights, their air conditioners, their stoves, everything, and there's this really dramatic neck of the duck spike curve, much peakier than the old traditional. Doesn't look like a bell curve, just looks like a kind of a rocketing. Uh, neck of the duck spike towards the end of the day. And that's the duck curve. And yeah, it's got a peak, like the old peak uh, in principle, but it's spikier. 
And it has a problem that we've never had before, not in any real way, which is overgeneration, which can be from a grid perspective, more destabilizing, actually significantly more destabilizing to the grid than a peak, than like too much demand. Hopefully that answers the question. Great job, Mike. Thank you so much. All right, the next question is directed for Chad, but if Steve needs to weigh in, given Chad was not at Poway quite yet during the bidding process, but the question is, what process, aka bidding process, did Poway Unified School District use to select Green Charge Networks for the energy storage project? Yeah, so uh, this I, was actually done before I got here, but uh, they did go out for um, an RFP process uh, and, and went out, uh, got, got kind of what our what we were looking for, what we were trying to uh, get done, and then Green Charge was the successful bidder on that. I don't know, Steve, if you want to add to that or no, I, I you're absolutely right. Is they evaluated a number of different providers. Um, I think some of the key components of that were. We had uh, a number of school districts in San Diego. So one of the other larger districts down there, Grossmont, had already selected us. And we had quite a bit of installations. So they went through a public process. What was really important to them was experience and, and proving that you could actually do those savings and having a model that really created no risk for the district. Um, so those were some of the key things that was really important to them in their evaluation process. Um, Hopefully that helps. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, technical question for Mike. What kind of refrigerant is used in the Ice Bear technology? Uh, the refrigerant we use is R410A, which is just the industry standard uh, refrigerant. We don't use it because we especially want to use R410A. We just use whatever refrigerant is the industry standard for air conditioning. Steve, on one of your slides, you referenced pioneering PEA. Can you define PEA? Sure. That was power efficiency agreement. That is our finance solution where we uh, do a free evaluation. We own, operate, install the asset, and then we share the savings. So it's really just the name for our financing solution. Great. Thank you. And two more questions for you, Steve. Um, are, the Green Charge Network storage technologies, are those lithium batteries? They are. We, we use a broad set of different providers, uh, whether it's Tesla or Samsung or BYD, um, and they are all lithium ion uh, batteries. So we really found that to be the most stable and bankable and safe technology. And that's what we primarily use today in all of our applications. Great. And do you know, can you speak to the life of these batteries and, and the degrade? degradation rate? Sure can. So traditionally, most lithium-ion batteries have come with a 10-year warranty. Um, in most of the batteries that we are procuring through the rest of this year, you'll see a 15 to 20-year life cycle on them. Um, the degradation rate, and degradation, sorry, right now on a 10-year is about 70% is what they warranty. We're actually seeing less than that in the field. So we're seeing about a 1 to 1.5% 1 reduction on their curve. Um, for the D-rate, um, so we're, we're happy with what we're seeing in the marketplace there. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm just going to make my way through a few more questions. Thanks again for going over the time. Um, we did have some interest on the chat box for the Ice Bear residential units, and there were some questions about the cost. Um, I will direct folks directly to um, ICE Energy for inquiring about the cost of these technologies and, and if people want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to make those introductions or give you the right contact info. Um, there are some other comments about how energy storage is, is helping with the economic benefits associated with the utilities proposed time of use rates. Um, I can speak to this a little bit and if anybody wants to add in, you know, just using that energy storage for, for arbitrage. So releasing that energy storage back to the grid during peak time is that is the way that you will find those economic benefits of, of storage given the solar unfriendly time of use rates that we're seeing proposed by by the utilities um, all right let me just see claude 
you mentioned that um, Horizon is, you know, financially agnostic and, and proposes many diff different types of financing products. Can you speak a little bit more to any projects that use PACE? Sure. Um, I've actually found a, a lot of customers of late go, go PACE. Uh, one of the things that customers like about PACE is that uh, it's, it's, it's sort of off their balance sheet. Um, it, it's a line item on their property taxes. And so some customers say, well, you know, the interest rate's a little high. I'd rather do it another way. And my answer is great. Look, however you want to finance this, I'm more than happy to, to help arrange it. Um, but yeah, a lot of customers, um, a lot of customers choose PACE. Um, I've even had a, a couple of nonprofits um, look at that. But, uh, but as a general rule, uh, it's for-profit customers um, that, uh, that just, just kind of an easier way to go. Um, so PACE is gaining traction and we're using it a lot. That's great to hear. Um, all right, I think we'll do one final question, perhaps for the Solar Plus Storage Project. Um, can you speak to how much in capital cost does a battery storage system add? Give it as a percentage of solar PV capital cost such that one never needs a kilowatt hour from the utility. Um, Well, I, I think if you looked at some of the metrics, um, you're looking at about $650 per megawatt or kilowatt that would be installed, and you're getting about 50 to 60% of that paid by the California S-chip. And if you took ITC, you would get a lower S-chip amount, but would be able to qualify for the 30% uh, investment tax credit. So it's actually a very attractive um, price point right now to combine the two together. And many times we're seeing the storage as being a much faster payback than the solar. So it's complementing that project. Great. Thank you so much. So we, are, we have gone about six minutes over time, so we're going to wrap it up here. I apologize if we were unable to get to your question. Um, we'll do our best to follow up directly with the folks um, who have unanswered questions. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you don't hear a response. I noticed a few of the latest questions coming in regarding EVs and ZNE. Again, if you go to our ZNE webpage here on this slide, energycenter.org slash ZNE, we did put on an EV plus ZNE webinar last year where you can find that recording. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much to our presenters, and this recording will be sent out. Have a great day.